Catan, the gods of real space. The lore of Warhammer 40k goes back millions and millions of years, long before the present squabbles of humans, orcs, Eldar, and chaos. It's often surprising to some that as highly advanced as, say, the Imperium of Mankind is, with their giant ships and virus bombs and walking titans, their technology and power doesn't hold a candle to some civilizations from millions of years prior. The Necrons, the walking metallic undead that have been slowly awakening in the present day, were once the most powerful civilization to ever exist but they didn't become so without a little assistance. That assistance came in the form of the Catan, enigmatic entities that predate pretty much every other form of life in existence, and continue to exist in the present day. I've already discussed them briefly in my video covering the Necrons, but let's dive into a little more detail about these reality-bending gods. Seen as how they're said to be the first entities created, at the beginning of the universe, we don't exactly have any historical records in-universe detailing their creation. It's said that they were formed at the same moment as creation itself, forming from the vast energies unleashed in that moment. At this time, long before the first planets came into shape, the Catan emerged from the roiling seas of plasma and solar flares, bearing little resemblance to their later forms. Here they were simply monstrous parasites that took to suckling on the solar energies of various stars, shortening the star's lifespan by millions of years. They proceeded to use the universe's electromagnetic flux to drift across the cosmos to feed on as many stars as they could. They were entities of pure energy, and only the vast power of a star could nourish them, so they ignored the relatively barren planets they drifted by. During this untold time, as these star vampires continued to drift and feed, a race of sapient creatures began to expand across the universe, utilizing both advanced technologies and potent psychic powers known today only as the Old Ones. According to one Catan, known as the Deceiver, the Old Ones went to war with the Star Vampires, and won, forcing them into hiding for a great many years. We have no way of knowing if this is true, and an entity known as the Deceiver is not the most reliable source, but what we do know is that the Catan were eventually discovered by the Necrontier, the Necrontier were an unfortunate race of humanoids that originated on a barren and radiation-blasted world. They lived short, bleak lives here, their cities little more than massive tombs, and eventually realized that science would never allow them to live comfortably on this planet. Instead, they took to the stars, utilizing slow-moving ships equipped with stasis crypts. Before long, they met the Old Ones and saw how hopeful and powerful the Old Ones were. They petitioned them for their secret of long life, but the Old Ones refused to share any knowledge. This ignited a fire in the hearts of the Necrontier, who dedicated their lives to destroying the Old Ones. This was a rather questionable decision, however, as the Old Ones outclassed the Necrontier in practically every way including their way of traveling vast distances due to a system known as the Webway, and their psychic abilities. To no one's surprise, the Old Ones easily beat the Necrontier back into the far reaches of space, where they were considered to be little more than a minor annoyance. Here they sat, in a form of impotent imprisonment, for centuries, desperately attempting to find a suitable weapon to use to strike back against the Old Ones. During this time, the surviving Necrontier fell into a war of succession, with the various dynasties vying for control. The leader of the Necrontier, Zarek the Silent King, began to perceive some anomalies in the oldest dying stars, leading to an extremely curious discovery. There were entities living on these stars, 
creatures of pure energy feeding on solar flares and magnetic storms. These creatures were perceived by the Necrontier as the children of their death god, and believed that they would be the weapons they needed to strike down the Old Ones. As such, they named these entities Catan, meaning Star Gods. How exactly the Necrontier managed to make contact with such vast and alien entities of energy is unknown, but for them to be used as weapons, they needed physical bodies of some sort. The Necrontier had access to a material called Necrodermis, or living metal, which in layman's terms would be akin to nanomachines. They had used this material to make their starships, but now it could be used to provide a physical body for the Catan to inhabit. This was a new mode of existence for the Catan, and they came to understand the realities of corporeal life, and appreciate the pleasures that could be available to creatures of matter. The first Catan to enter a physical form, Azagorod the Nightbringer, realized that the life forces of mortals tasted far better than that of the stars they had been feeding on for millennia. The Nightbringer began feeding on the Necrontier, gorging itself on their terror and suffering, and it only ceased once the Necrontier pledged their servitude and convinced it that there were species without number across the galaxy. Soon the Nightbringer gave physical form to other Catan, who each began craving worshippers and slaves, spreading insanity and death across the cosmos. They were akin to gods operating in real space, the antithesis of the chaos gods of the warp. Thanks to the vast capabilities and knowledge of the Catan, the Necrontier were poised to relaunch their war against the Old Ones, but one of the Catan still had a plan for the Necrontier. One of the Catan, named Mephitran, was the most insidious and deceptive among them, who enjoyed using trickery and lies to achieve its goals. Even among the Catan, it was distrusted and shunned, earning it the name of the Deceiver. It was the Deceiver that came to the Necrontier and told them that there was a way to extend their lives and achieve immortality by shedding their mortal flesh and transferring their minds into metal bodies. The Triarch, the ruling body of the Necrontier, debated for months on the decision, until finally agreeing to the process of biotransference. Massive bio-furnaces were set up to destroy the Necrontier's weak bodies and encase their minds in living metal, but they were of course deceived as the Catan gathered around these furnaces and consumed their life force in the process. The Catan grew even stronger, and the Necrontier were no more, instead becoming the Necrons, everlasting servants devoid of free will, set to conquer the galaxy in order to continue feeding their masters. With the power of both the Catan and the Necrons combined, the Old Ones stood little chance. The Catan could bend reality to their will, and during their conquests, planets were raised, suns were extinguished, and entire systems were devoured by black holes. Thanks to one of the Catan, the Necrons were able to gain access to the Old One's webway, giving them the ability to swiftly travel the cosmos and accelerate the war against the Old Ones. Unfortunately for the Catan, however, they were not immune to the same squabbles that plagued all sapient races, although the exact reason for the cause of their civil war is unknown. In one version, one of the Eldar gods, the Laughing God, tricked one of the Catan into eating another Catan, driving it insane. In another version, the Deceiver managed to convince the other Catan that of all the life forces that they could consume, the Catan themselves were the greatest, causing a civil war to break out amongst them as the strong fed on the weak. Together the Catan and the Necrons were the greatest force the galaxy had ever seen, but nothing lasts forever. With their infighting, the Catan were weakened and a number of races that the Old Ones had created and fostered had begun to rise up in strength and numbers, notably the Eldari. 
Due to these races sharing the Old One's affinity for the warp, they were able to battle against the cold science of the Necrons, pushing them and the Catan back across space. Facing down a potential defeat, the Catan rallied together once more and managed to seal off the warp from sectors of material space, weakening their opponents that depended on the warp for their power. Before long, the Catan and the Necrons had managed to annihilate the Old Ones completely, and they were poised to become the dominant empire of the galaxy. In this moment of victory, however, the silent king of the Necrons, Sarek, chose to take the opportunity to turn against their masters. Sarek had been imbued during the biotransference with the capability of controlling the entire Necron race, and so he turned their weapons against the Catan in a great revolt. As powerful as the Catan were, they were few, and eventually the might of the Necrons overwhelmed them. That's not to suggest that this revolt was a simple matter, as the devastation was great, and the weapons the Necrons used against them were so terrible that the Silent King ordered them destroyed afterwards, and it's said that they damaged causality itself in the process. Afterwards, the exhaustion of winning two wars and the prospects of fighting a third against the Eldar caused the Necrons to go into a great hibernation. Most of the Catan were simply shattered into a number of shards, but some, such as Landegor, were completely annihilated. In Landegor's case, this annihilation prompted it to afflict the Necrons with a virus that causes some of them to go insane with bloodlust, becoming known as Flayed Ones. As for the Shattered Catan, they became fragmented into a number of shards, each one an echo of their former self. The Necrons managed to take these shards and contain them in small artifacts called Tesseract Labyrinths. No individual shard has a full recollection of the complete entity it once was, although this doesn't exactly prevent it from harnessing the same power that the Catan displayed. Even as a shard, these entities, if unleashed, can devastate an entire battlefield with little effort. The Necrons in the present day utilize these shards on occasion if the situation calls for it, but they are wary to do so as it's certainly possible for a shard to break from enslavement. Lost shards of the Catan have been spotted in a number of different places across the galaxy, often attempting to gather up what power they can and enslaving what people they can. Sometimes, in dire situations, the Necrons will unleash an amalgamation of a number of shards gathered together, in a form known as a Transcendent Catan although the chance of collateral damage from such an entity is nearly guaranteed. Let's go over some of the known Catan and their present status. As a Garad, the Nightbringer delights in death, suffering, and despair, and it's no surprise that it became known to the Necrontyr as a god of death. The Eldar called it the Destroyer of Light, while humanity called it the Reaper, and it nourished itself on the fear it caused across the galaxy. Azagorod was the first to appear to the Necrontyr, and in some legends was also the first to be tricked or convinced into consuming the other Catan. It was shattered by the Necrons' god-killing hypercannons, and its shards were enslaved. Iash Udra was thought by the Silent King to be the most reviled, and was called the Endless Swarm. It was said to be an everlasting sickness that was birthed in the minds of mortals, continuously being behind and seen through the eyes of all. Apparently, the sorrow of the Void brought it to the mortal brink and severed its bonds, upon which point a thousand tides of misery were released upon the stars. One of its shards is possessed by Trazin the Infinite, a Necron overlord and keeper of history. As mentioned, Landugor, the Flayed One, was obliterated by the Necrons apparently on the Silent King's orders, and as such there are no shards remaining. 
Magladroth, the Void Dragon, was said to be the greatest and most terrible of all the Catan. Magladroth was a figure of wanton destruction and devastation, but was also responsible for creating the warp suppression pylons spread across the galaxy to block the Old One's source of psychic power, some of which were located on Cadia. Magladroth was also shattered during the Necron's revolt, its shards imprisoned, although a number of shards escaped. One loose shard managed to lay waste to an entire dynasty of Necrons that went to retrieve it, and it gorged itself on a dozen worlds before being imprisoned. According to some legends, the Void Dragon is the same entity as the Dragon of Mars, an ancient, powerful creature that was defeated by the Emperor of Mankind at some point in the past, and imprisoned in a labyrinth underneath the surface of Mars. There are some similarities between the two, such as the Dragon of Mars being said to have once lived in space between the stars. It had brought entire civilizations into existence and then snuffed them out on a whim, and it waged war with its own kind. Without knowing more about the Dragon of Mars, however, it's impossible to say if it's the same entity as Magladroth. Mephetran, the Deceiver, was the one responsible for convincing the Necrontier to throw off their mortal forms, and was one of the physically weakest Catan, only surviving due to its deception and cowardice. During the Necron Revolt, the Deceiver was quickly shattered, and a number of its shards were imprisoned by the Necrons. Despite this, however, there have been a fair number of shards discovered elsewhere, and each one has been capable of disguising itself in various forms and allowing it to continue wreaking havoc through deception. One shard appeared as a planetary governor, another as a Necron overlord named Nefreth, and another as the Primarch Omegon. It seems likely that the Deceiver is going to continue to be a thorn in just about everyone's sides. Nyadrazatha, the Burning One, was the Catan responsible for revealing to the Necrons on how to access the Old One's webway, thanks to living stone portals known as Dolmen Gates. It was known as an entity that took glee in burning any and all things, and it wished to bring its eldritch fire into the webway. During the Necron Revolt, it's said that the Silent King Zarek himself shattered Nyadrazatha with his spear, and one of its shards now powers the Silent King's personal vehicle. Another of its shards was eventually found and claimed by Trazen the Infinite. Saranoga, the Outsider, is one of the more enigmatic of the Catan, being fairly insane from the onset. Its gaze caused madness and despair, and those in its presence would often rather take their own lives than endure more of it. According to some Eldar legends, the Outsider was the one that was tricked by the Laughing God into devouring its brethren, and this is what truly drove it insane. Regardless, its ultimate fate is fairly unclear, but it doesn't seem to be the case that the Necrons shattered it, instead stating that its madness had become too terrible of a foe to slay. Some claim that it rent itself asunder, while the more common thought is that it went into hiding, until it will someday emerge and spread its madness once more. Igrania, the World Shaper, was responsible, as its name implies, for forming a number of artificial worlds belonging to the Necrons. Principal among these was a world named Borsis, also called the World Engine. After Igrania was shattered, one of its great shards was placed inside of Borsis, and in the 41st millennium, a Necron dynasty activated the world and sent it on a path straight to Mars to activate the dragon. The shard, however, didn't want to go through with this plan, and instead managed to contact a space marine chapter. In the end, it made a deal to destroy Borsis if the Imperium would let it go and leave the galaxy which it appeared to do so. Necron forces are in possession of other shards of Igrania and have used them in battle against the Imperium. 
Zarhulash, the potentate, was another that was shattered and enslaved by the Necrons, and was used to power a Necron Pharos, a piece of technology that allowed a user to find, communicate, and even teleport to a location through quantum entanglement rather than the warp. The Archmagos Belisarius Call studied this Pharos and communicated with Zarhulish, who told him that the Catan were the only true gods of the galaxy, and the Necrons were treacherous children who the Catan will someday take revenge against. Call managed to trick Zarhulash into helping him, at which point he teleported Zarhulash to the far end of the galaxy, surrounded by Necron tomb worlds. There are a number of other Catan that have been shattered into shards, which are either contained by the Necrons or are otherwise scattered across the cosmos. There's almost certainly a number more Catan that are unknown, either still intact or perhaps having never been contained in the material realm by the Necron tier in the first place. It's clear that the Catan are not a benevolent force, but they have since become a devastating part of the Necron's war force, as shackled weapons. If they can continue to gather more and more of these shards, and keep them contained for their own purposes, the Necrons could become a truly unbeatable force. On the other hand, if certain scattered Catan can manage to grow in power and rebuild themselves, it's not out of the question that they could become a dominant force in their own right re-enslaving a number of lesser species. As it stands though, the Catan serve two purposes within the larger context of Warhammer 40k. They are an interesting aspect of Necron armies that give them access to reality-bending powers, and they appear in all sorts of far-flung places, generally as a shard, capable of instigating all sorts of havoc for pretty much every other faction in the universe. It took everything that the Necrons had, being arguably the most powerful civilization to ever exist, to take down the Catan before, so it's hard to say what would happen if the Catan returned to power. There are a lot of powerful factions and entities in the 40k universe, but being considered the gods of real space certainly commands some respect.